Good evening, everyone. My name is Tamara Nambia, and I will be introducing Deepika Padkone. As a celebrity, the choices she made every day were subjected to public controversy and criticism. Nonetheless, she always managed to stay strong and poised. Her formula was, be authentic, be yourself. Deepika, I have a few questions for you. When I grow up, I want to become an artist, a scientist, and a singer. When I read your story, you were a great badminton player but chose to become an actor. How did you choose from an actor and a badminton player? You know the same way that you want to be an artist and a scientist? How do you feel? You can achieve both, right? You feel like if you set your heart on something, you can do that. And then you want to do something else and you can do that too. Um, so honestly, when I was growing up, I was, even before I realized, I started playing professional badminton. But it's when I was a teenager, I realized that maybe this is not something that I want to continue and pursue and play professionally. And every time I watched a movie, somehow I felt like that's where I belonged. So it's my gut that told me that I wanted to transition from being an athlete to being an actor. And then I followed my gut. You know what gut is? Like your instinct, like that voice inside you that tells you what is right and what is wrong? That. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> How are you? Uh, next, can we have uh, Anuradha Paul, uh, the role model, and the question that's going to be posed to her uh, is by Anya. Good evening, everyone. I'm Anya Abraham, and I've written for this book. Today, I have the honor of introducing Anuradha Pal. Um, her chosen journey was filled with roadblocks. She encountered discrimination for being a woman, trying to master a masculine instrument, skepticism for being young, and resistance for not hailing from a musical family. But Anuradha was not deterred. She was relentless with her discipline, training, and confidence. And I truly admire that. I have a question for Ms. Anuradha Pal, if I may. Even though I'm 12, I have very little time. I have to study, play a sport, and learn music. And I'm always being told to do more with my time. You have done so much. How do you do it? Firstly, I don't think I've done so much. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Uh, very uh, thank you so much for this great honor and uh, privilege meeting you, ma'am. Uh, <coughs> Not you. <laughs> that was deliberate. <laughs> well, um, you know, when I, um, the one most important thing that I learned uh, since there's a paucity of time, I'm going straight to the point. When I went through all the discrimination, the one thing I learned was not to listen to that negativity, to focus on my goal, to focus on what I wanted to do, what my heart was telling me to do. And I knew that 
ultimately my passion will let, you know, will do the talking. And um, so when I went through that journey, I was dismissed at every point, I was discriminated, but uh, my parents egged me on, though I don't come from a musician family, they were kind enough to en encourage that passion. And um, uh, also, my gurus, Ustad Lala Rakha and Zakir Hussain, set such exacting standards, and they basically uh, were so uncompromising. I'll tell you a little short, you know, an incident. I was uh, just 15 years old uh, when uh, Ustad Zakir Hussain asked me to accompany him on a concert tour. And um, so he, um, <clears throat> we were traveling and at the moment I, I was so excited, uh, you know, he called me at night and he said, what are you doing in the morning? And I said, what am I doing? Getting up in the morning. So, <laughs> so he said, meet me at the airport. And I went to the airport and, um, and he had a flight ticket for him for Jaipur. And he said, go off to sleep. I said, but I'm so excited, I'm traveling with you. So he said, well, just go to sleep. And the first thing I learned was, he said, you're gonna travel all your life, you're gonna need rest. The moment you need, you have a mom opportunity, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then I reached there and uh, we did this grueling tour. I was uh, put through a, a drill of uh, lots of practice and all that. Of course, earlier I had gone through 10 hours of uh, Chilla, which is called 10 hours of practice every day for 40 days, uh, which I followed as a routine from the time I was in school. Uh, because I wanted to ramp up before I learn from such great gurus. And uh, so when I went on with uh, Zakir Bhai, he tells me that, you know, uh, tomorrow you, you're going to play a concert with, uh, you play the concert and I'm going back to Bombay. And uh, I said, but uh, there are going to be eggs on my face, <laughs> you know, if I play instead of you. So he said, okay, stay up all night. And there was a Kathak dancer. And he said, sit up all night and practice with her. And I did. In this little room, we were, I was locked up in this little room with no guidance from the master, nothing, no word. And I, all I had to do was learn from the beginning whatever I had to do. The next day I performed, um, you know, we, I kept practicing and he, he kept saying he's leaving, but he didn't. Finally, in the evening, when, when uh, it was time for the performance, he says, you know what, you're not playing with the dancer, but you're playing with me. I said, oh wow, great. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know a whole night I was practicing with the dancer, but that's fine. So when I get to, get to the stage, he's, I said, so what are you gonna play? So he said, what's your age? I said, I'm 15. So, okay, so we'll play 15 beats. I said, no, 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 no. I'm 16, because 16 beats is a little easier to play. <laughs> so he said, no, now the damage is done. You said you're 15, play it. And I was put right into the drill. I had never learned that, that tal in my life, but I was put straight into the thing, and I played. By God's blessing, I somehow managed. But I was, there was a, there was one point where I think I didn't do as well as he expected. Obviously, I was so scared. So he put me through a huge punishment. And the punishment was go up and down all the stairs and all the things. You know, anyway, it was a very bad punishment. So, so that was one, one uh, thing that I learned, how to be quick-witted that day. I learned to be quick-witted, how to be adapting to the situation. and. It helped me when I play with all the great masters now that I play with since I've been 13, I've been playing uh, with all the great masters, been performing since I was 10, but that helped me a lot. So I think putting yourself to that grill and making sure that you actually surrender to learning uh, does help. Uh, also, I think, uh, of course, there were many incidences like that sometimes, you know, and through my college days, I mean, I was doing crazy things. I had a very, very crazy schedule when I was in school. By the way, to answer your question. Uh, I used to get up at five, practice, go to school, come back at 3.30, from four o'clock to six o'clock do my homework and studies. No time to play, no time to rest, no time to do anything. Six o'clock leave for my gurus, 
7 to 10, they're all the way from Juhu to Napensi Road, travel and come and till 11 o'clock at night, go back to, Bom to my house, again the next day the same drill. So I think all these things, so I, I, I personally believe that hard work and really, really focusing and being determined about what you want to achieve is really, really important and is the driving force. What also, um, so I mean, when, when you say what, how did I manage my time? Yes, the most important thing I would say if I learned from my father uh, was uh, how to multitask, how to uh, completely um, be focused and disciplined about everything, orderliness, timeliness, punctuality, being able to do many things. So I think all these things really, really matter. And incidentally, last, uh, you know, just to tell you on a very, in a very personal, on a very personal note, uh, you know, uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, 2017 was a very bad year because I lost five family members. And in 2016, when my father got an epileptic seizure, it was just three hours before a major concert that I had. And when I was winning him into the ICU, he kept saying, go to your concert, focus on your goal, okay? 2017, when he passed away, three days after that, my, I had a concert right here at the uh, Sophia's, Sophia, Hall, uh, Sophia Baba Hall. And my mother came to encourage me in the concert, three days after. Last night, I had to take my mother to the ICU. I just was up all night in the hospital looking after her, and I've just come straight from the hospital here. And the only thing she told me yesterday is, you're not gonna break your commitment. You're gonna stand by what you did, and that is the true meaning of being a professional. These days, people think being a professional is about how you earn money. I don't think so. I think it's about how, you, how committed and dedicated you are to whatever your art is or whatever your passion is. And it's about making sure that you stand by your word and become a person of character. And that's what I truly believe is important to be able to achieve one's goals. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you, Anuradha, and uh, we wish your mom uh, all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, for the next role model, let's have Moksha come up here, and she's going to pose her question uh, to Brinda Somaya. Hi, everyone. My name is Moksha Davalor. I'm 12 years old, and I have the honor of introducing our guest, Miss Brinda Somaya. So here are a couple excerpts from her story in the book. Brinda Somaya is an architect. She designs buildings. Brinda is also an urban conservationist. She protects the spaces around the new structures that she builds. In 2001, Brinda turned her attention to Badali, a little village in Gujarat that was demolished by an earthquake. Was it possible to rebuild the village exactly the way it was before the disaster? Yes, it was. Brinda did just that. So I had the honor and the opportunity to write Ms. Somaya's story. And despite all my research, uh, we came up with a couple questions for her. The first one being, I live in the US and I know you studied there. So what made you decide to move back to India and to set up your architectural firm here? And secondly, what made you decide to work publicly and volunteer to build and restore public spaces? Well. I was just waiting outside, and one of the gentlemen there told me that I'm well dotted. So <laughs> it's great to be here, and I would like to first congratulate the three women, Lakshmi, Reema, and uh, Sharda, for bringing out a book for children, because this is something we all want to do and need to do desperately. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a different generation from some of the young ladies sitting here. Um, I was in America those days, it was the 70s and 80s, and uh, many people who went there at that time never returned. A lot of my classmates, a lot of young people, we all know that. Um, I remember studying there, and one summer I was at 
Cornell Summer School, where I now happen to be a professor. And I spent the whole afternoon with a whole lot of Indian professors and their wives having lunch. And they spent the whole hour or two talking about India. And I saw myself maybe 20 years from then doing the same thing. And that's not what I wanted to do. I certainly did not want to be peripheral to any society in which I lived. So I had actually got admission to another master's degree. I went home. I mean, I went back to my university and I called my mother and said, I'm coming home. And no regrets, because I think to live and work, <laughs> to live and work in a country as rich in its culture, in its diversity, in its language, in its food, in its art, and its culture, and feel that, that you are part of it. To me, that's the most important thing. And that's why I came home. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and to round up the panel, uh, can I have uh, Kavya come up here and uh, pose a question to uh, uh, who are we posing the question to? Dr. Seema Rao. Dr. Seema Rao, please. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste to everyone. I'm Kavya Davlor, and I'm here to introduce Dr. Seema Rao. Seema Rao, first Indian woman commando trainer. Thank you, thank you. Here is a passage from her story in the book. As a child, Seema was bullied. She would cringe with a mixture of helplessness and revolt, hoping for a strength that would put her on par with the bullies. Years later, after she became a medical doctor and married, her husband introduced her to martial arts. She embraced it and began her transformation from weakness to strength. Dr. Seema Rao, I have two questions for you. Yes, what are they? <laughs> Number one, I'm eight years old and I've seen many kids being bullied. Okay. I've also experienced it myself. From your story, I know that you were bullied. Can you tell me and all the other kids out there about it? Question number two. Yeah. Okay, uh, first and foremost, let me say that I'm extremely uh, happy to be here with you wonderful people. And uh, otherwise, my life is all about commando training. Uh, I'm India's first and only woman commando trainer. Yes, I train men commandos. and. <laughs> Thank you. And I go to the nook and corner of uh, the country. I go to ice-clad mountains, scorching hot deserts, and uh, you know dense jungles. And I train the commandos. So uh, if you look at me, you'll wonder how uh, you know I reached commando training. Well, it was not my life's design to be there. Uh, you know, we all believe in destiny, so that's what destiny had something else in mind for me. So I started off as a doctor, but ended up uh, training commandos of the Indian forces. Um, I'm going to talk about my childhood because I think, uh, you know, certain incidents in our life change the way we think and change what we want to become. Uh, one of the incidents was way back in school. What's your age? Eight. Eight. I must have been about eight or nine years old when there was an incident in school that uh, you know changed me. There were these uh, you know girls in our uh, class, and they were uh, you know ones who had failed the class, so they were about two years elder to all of us. So one day, what those girls did is they uh, you know lit some firecrackers under the desk, and one of the girls' uniform caught fire. And everybody ran helter-skelter, and there was only this girl whose uniform got fire, and obviously she was hospitalized. And uh, everybody was asked in the class that who was responsible for this. Uh, nobody owned up. Uh, now, you know, the thing is that uh, I, I am also the daughter of a freedom fighter. I was very close to my father. 
So I think a certain degree of righteousness is, uh, you know, what I had inside me, which I realized when when this incident happened, and you know, I realized that I was the only one to to tell, uh, you know, the the staff, the teachers, that it was these girls who were responsible for that incident. Nobody else said anything, but I was the only one. I was afraid, there's no doubt about that. But somewhere I thought it was just unjust. And I thought that, you know, people who are responsible for doing harm to somebody else should be taken to task. So um, that was what happened then. And uh, of course, I paid the price for that because, uh, you know, uh, about a few days later, my exams were around the corner. Those girls were taken to task and they were uh, punished. So they had to get back. So one day when the school uh, left and we were all leaving the classroom, I was the last one to get out. And uh, these girls cornered me in the corridor. They caught hold of my hands. They pulled my bag. They removed my journal and they tore it to pieces in front of my eyes. Now, you know, when you're the studious type and you see your journal being torn and the exam around the corner and you know that it's going to cost you your marks. So, I looked at them with disbelief, tears in my eyes, and I couldn't do anything about that. And I still remember that helplessness that I felt uh, at that time. Years later, I would like to tell you about another incident, but this was, uh, you know, when I was uh, about 17 or 18 years old. So um, I met this young doctor male, he was into martial art, and then that's when I realized that if I had to change from weakness to strength, then this was one way I could do that. So I started learning from him. And there was this incident uh, which, again, uh, changed me forever. Uh, we used to live in Chopati, very close by. So we used to go to the beach and we used to practice martial art. Uh, let me say that we are a very, very uh, bonded couple. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, in the, in the forces, people call us the ideal buddy pair. Uh, the ideal buddy pair is a concept where two people are that close that I can trust my back and that nobody is going to shoot from there because of him and the same with him. So uh, coming back to the story, so we were training over there on the beach and uh, it was about uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. It was a hot, sunny day. And the beach was getting empty. It was time for us to go back. When suddenly there were a group of these, uh, you know, uh, rack pickers who were passing by. And uh, they happened to look down and uh, see what we were doing. And they started passing lewd, demeaning remarks at me. We decided to just ignore them, continue with the training. And once we got off, they were standing at a distance and we had to pass by from that route. So my husband said that, uh, okay, now that those guys are there, uh, you know, you're going to have to face them. And saying this, he moved out of that place. Uh, I think that was very important. I thank him for that because I, I think that day I decided or I learned to fight my own battles. As I walked towards them, I was very scared. So I decided that maybe I'll just walk across and finish with the whole thing. And suddenly one of the guys came and stood in front of me. I was looking down and he was in front of me. I moved to the left, he moved in front of me. I moved to the right, he moved in front of me again. So he was obstructing my path. I was looking down and I was very scared. And slowly I looked up at him. And what I saw in his eyes, I did not like. I saw underestimation. I saw the look as if, you're just a woman. What can you do? You're weak. You can't harm me. And, you know, I don't know what came over me, but I lifted my hand and I slapped him across the face. He got extremely enraged. He came back at me, okay, and he tried to headbutt me, tried to hit his head into my face. Luckily, I just bent, you know, bent down and I lifted my knee high up and he got a hard shot on his head. In the meanwhile, the other guy who was with him, he came towards me, he opened up a knife and slashed it across my body. Thankfully for my reflexes, I just moved out, my t-shirt tore but not my skin. I was enraged, I grabbed his hand and I just threw him down on the ground. Soon there were other people who came there and the rest is history. But what I want to say here is that uh, bullying is a very common thing that happens to all of us, I think. But you know, I, 
personally, I didn't want to be on the receiving end of that. I was weak, there's no doubt about that. But I decided that that equation had to change. I couldn't stay weak forever. So I wanted that equation to change. And later on, of course, uh, my life has been a, full of a lot of hardships, you know, two near fatal injuries during the 20 years of training the forces and uh, bankruptcy and, uh, you know, not wanting to have my own biological child, a lot of all that stuff. But let me say one thing at the end of the day, uh, if you're happy with what you do and if you face adversity, looking at it, you know, eye to eye, then that is what makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Dr. Rao. Thanks, Kavya. So that, that gives you an indication of how uh, inquisitive kids' minds are. And uh, what I'd love to do next is to stitch that up with a, with a personal favorite story of mine. And I hope uh, this dazzles you as much as it dazzled me. And then we can get into a discussion with you guys as to what you think, how fair or unfair the world has been. Um, I do want to start with a disclaimer that I, I, my job in this panel is to bring the law of averages of some power-hitting women out here down a bit, because that's what I do. Um, 